after the, I thought, very good uh, keynote speech uh, this morning, uh, where we focused very much on the, um, on the CWC, so the, the, the sort of already existing legal framework that it provides. I think in this session we will take, a, take one step back and look a bit more at uh, sort of the substance behind it, and quite literally the substance. So we'll, we have two speakers, two uh, people to introduce the topics, uh, who um, are certainly experts and maybe the experts on uh, when it comes to toxicity of warfare, but also toxicity uh, issues uh, surrounding military bases and, and uh, military activities. Um, they are already introduced now because I did it themselves, so that's great. That saves time. I just wanted to say we, we'll start with Doug. Doug Ware. Uh, I've known Doug for a long time. Uh, I think we date back to meeting each other in Beijing, where we cycled a lot and uh, met a lot of Chinese people. It was the first ever civil society um, conference organized in China, according to the Chinese, which was a bewildering experience because they had no idea what to do with us. And they had a lot of uh, eavesdropping equipment and people having oversight of the conference. Uh, nonetheless, um, Doug was already back then uh, involved a lot in, um, in work on depleted uranium um, and was there to uh, explain to uh, the Chinese uh, what that was all about. Um, uh, more recently, he has also uh, uh, been starting a project together with my organization, PAX, uh, called Toxic Remnants of War Project, uh, or the Toxic Remnants of War Network, I have to say. Um, and I think he's going to explain to us more about what that all entails. Doug. Well, good morning. Uh, thanks to the organizers. Much appreciated. First time in Israel. Quite unusual. Um, yeah. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about what we do uh, and why we're doing it and why we're doing it now. Um, we talked a little bit about auspicious times earlier this morning. And um, for progress on conflicts in the environment, this is also an auspicious time, which I'll explain. So um, do we have the slides up, the PowerPoint? Well, I'm glad I've got it in front of me because my eyes don't work very well and it's quite a long way away. Um, so, yeah, we've been working on depleted uranium for many years, more than I care to remember, um, through the International Coalition to Ban Uranium Weapons. And over that time, it's become apparent that... Depleted uranium isn't the only toxic thing released during conflict. And actually, the issues around it, which relate to how the environment is protected during conflict, how the environment is assessed after conflict, how public health is assessed after conflict, and questions of who cleans up, uh, who pays for it, they apply to many different substances and not just depleted uranium. So back in 2012, um, ICBUW, I'm trying to avoid acronyms. What does PAX stand for? Oh yeah, peace. <laughs> um, back in 2012, we launched this project, which was essentially a scoping study to look at the extent of civilian harm from environmental pollution, which results from conflicts and military activities. We've been looking at the legal frameworks to see whether existing protection uh, is adequate. And also this question of, well, if we merge humanitarian and environmental principles, could we then use that to so, energize a civil society campaign to try and increase protection uh, for both human health and the environment uh, before, during, and after conflict? So we first had to define what we were talking about. If we just go to the next one. And so a toxic remnant of war we see as being any toxic or radiological substance resulting from munitions or military activities that forms a hazard to human or environmental health. Now, we've heard quite a bit about chemical weapons we're interested in the stuff kind of beyond chemical weapons. Uh, so not munitions which are directly designed to be toxic, but munitions with incidental toxicity or substances released during conflict. Um, there's certainly some overlap, but as the Chemical Weapons Convention is already in place, then <laughs> we're kind of interested in dealing with the stuff beyond that. Um, let's go to the next one. So we kind of had to first classify what we meant. So, God, it's far away. <laughs> so we're talking really about um, toxic remnants which are direct, so that are the immediate results of military activities. So weapons testing and production, poor stockpile management and demilitarization, targeting decisions, the use of munitions, poor waste management practices on bases, 
uh, abandoned military waste and ordnance and conflict wastes and rubble. So these are things which are the direct result of military activity. But there are also factors which are related to conflict, which also lead to pollution being generated or not being dealt with properly. So as a result of some of the conditions associated with conflict, you may have looting of industrial sites uh, where there are toxic industrial chemicals present, uh, lack of waste management, so domestic waste and refuse, weak environmental governance, and things which can allow the sort of illicit movement or dumping of toxic waste, which you've seen in uh, Somalia and elsewhere. Um, so just some more examples with photos, because that always makes it uh, easier. Um, so one example being Agent Orange in Vietnam, where you have dioxin contamination in various places around the country, uh, which still hasn't been dealt with uh, particularly effectively. You have pulverized building materials, so as the case of uh, Lebanon, where you have large amounts of concrete dust, you may have asbestos, you may have other toxic or incidental household products which may be mixed in with it. <coughs> you have direct attacks on infrastructure, such as oil wells, oil refineries, power stations. So recently in Gaza, we had power stations being targeted. Military waste disposal overseas, so Afghanistan, burn pits, uh, good examples. And more recently in Syria, again, attacks on oil facilities, which there is a perceived strategic advantage to them, which is questionable when you start to look into things. But what is the environmental harm and what is the public health impact and who cleans up and who takes responsibility for it after conflict? Let's get to the next one. So one of the issues with um, the environment generally in conflict is it comes fairly low down the pecking order um, of interests. And that's something which we need to work on collectively. Um, and it's been flagged up previously. Um, so while we respond to the shocking and immediate problems from conflict, refugee movements, uh, direct casualties of explosive violence, there may be long-term public health impacts uh, which can impact human rights and health uh, long after the conflict. Um, let's go to the next one. So there's, I talked a little bit about this being an auspicious time. Um, back in 2009, the UN Environment Programme published a fairly weighty report which looked at all the law which was applicable uh, during conflict. So this is hard law from treaty law and also soft law and norms. And the basic finding was that international humanitarian law is basically completely useless. Um, they didn't couch it in exactly those terms, but uh, <laughs> that was kind of the long and short of it. Um, it's very weak. It hasn't really developed since the 1970s, uh, late 70s. Um, and they provided a number of recommendations for how it might be improved. So a couple of years later, let's get to the next one, the uh, Red Cross, they put together a report which dealt with conflict in the environment. And they also sort of reiterated these findings that international environmental law, which has developed enormously since the 70s has completely outpaced international humanitarian law, the law of armed conflict. Uh, they reported that conflict pollutants threaten civilians. They found that environmental damage increases vulnerability. And they also went as far as suggesting a new me mechanism which could be developed. So this details obligations for assessment, for assistance, for the monitoring of infringements. Uh, and they suggested it could be modelled on something like the bans on landmines and cluster munitions. Okay, so um, since the 1970s, there's been a lot of international environmental law on, so Montreal Protocol on CFCs uh, being just one. You know, the environmental movement has flourished since the 70s, but when it comes to protection of the environment during conflict, then basically nothing has changed post-Vietnam. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So one of the other recommendations from UNEP was that the International Law Commission uh, take up the issue, and they've appointed a special rapporteur, Dr. Mary Jacobson, and she's now doing a three-year study into whether there are peacetime norms which could be applied to conflict, looking at the gaps, um, particularly looking at non-state actors and non-international armed conflicts. So again, it's similar with chemical weapons that where non-state actors are involved, things suddenly get a lot more complicated. Um, so she's doing that at the moment. She's a year in and will complete in 2016. Uh, An International Law Commission makes recommendations to the uh, UN General Assembly for how things could be improved legally. Um, 
we scared to the next one? So then there's a question of whether you can maybe start applying a human rights dimension to protection of the environment. And that's come up a couple of times at the UN Human Rights Council. So previously back in 2007, and then more recently in 2014. And there's kind of this interplay between human rights law and environmental law. Um, so access to environmental information, access to environmental assessment, the ability to take part in decision-making processes that affect your health and well-being and the environment. So there are these elements of human rights law and environmental law which are now merging, and it's a question of, well, could we make some use of that in trying to develop some kind of mechanism to help protect civilians after conflict? So, uh, yeah, this was a question. I mean, conflict is always going to be polluting. There's no two ways about it, but there's a question of whether could best practice and precautionary guidelines, so for example in not targeting industrial facilities, um, combined with some kind of mechanism on assessment and assistance, make it a bit less so, the aim being to reduce harm and improve post-conflict response. Um, what is very clear, as I said before, is that international humanitarian law provisions for the protection of the environment during conflict are completely useless. Um, but there's this question of, well, could you use human rights law, domestic and international environmental law, peacetime norms and standards to start informing how this new mechanism might be developed? Um, yeah, it's a fairly simple equation that if you can protect the environment, then you can protect civilians. You know, they shouldn't be seen as two separate things. It shouldn't be a case of, well, we can just protect the environment, but doing both will help achieve both. Um, so just to reiterate, so toxic remnants of war, it's something which doesn't really get enough attention, but it's common to pretty much every conflict. There is environmental pollution caused regardless of the conflict. Um, one of the issues I found was that conflict in the environment is a, a really big topic. There's everything from impact of warfare on areas of biological diversity and hotspots and nature reserves to refugee movements and their environmental impact. But within this sort of huge topic, this is kind of like a pragmatic uh, way of trying to reduce harm and it's kind of practical as well so um, it can also make use of the increasing civil and military awareness of toxics regulation so the military are becoming increasingly aware uh, it's a slow process as Lenny's doubtless going to mention uh, but within the civil sphere within the European Union we have uh, extremely good toxics legislation so there's a question of well can we try and extend some of these norms and standards to protection of civilians after conflict uh, and yeah, and the aim is to protect civilians and make post-conflict recovery somewhat more sustainable than it is. Um, it's quite interesting that there's good connections and opportunities potentially, but in terms of diplomacy, you often have this kind of bunker mentality where you have diplomats who just work on disarmament, just work on the environment, just work on human rights. So there's a possibility of, well, can you bring them together? And is there some interesting conversation points you can have in there? And the same with civil society, that a lot of these organizations, and Green Cross I think is probably quite unusual in that it works on <laughs> weapons, public health, and the environment. Um, but yeah, but there's a range of number of organizations who you could potentially bring together, who could bring different elements into the party. Um, so yeah, so we spent a couple of years looking at some of these toxic remnants issues, uh, getting the concept recognized, and then uh, this year have established a new network uh, with Norwegian People's Aid, so they do a lot of demining work. Article 36, who work expensively on explosive weapons and nuclear weapons and pretty much everything else. German lawyers at Ayalana, PAX, uh, ourselves, and then Green Cross, um, to start trying to push forward work on this issue. And the main objectives, so it's kind of one is to address this imbalance between peacetime health and environmental protection norms and those applicable in conflict. Um, to start more of a debate on trying to reduce the practices that generate toxic remnants. So again, this don't target heavy industry with bombs. Are there military waste management practices which could be changed or modified which will reduce the level of contamination? One of the key things is also to try and diversify the number of people who are doing environmental monitoring and assessment. And with that, we're trying to engage the mine action community who are already in the field clearing landmines, cluster munitions. Can they start taking environmental uh, measurements, recording data? Also the pub public health workers who at the moment don't really integrate environmental data into their public health records after conflict. So 
once you start getting this data back, then you can have an informed decision about how you should respond to it. And ultimately, to perhaps work towards a legal mechanism on uh, clearing toxic remnants of war. So, um, yeah, so just to conclude, so addressing conflict pollution will improve the protection of civilians and the environment. The current attention from international organizations like UNEP and the Red Cross and also the military is creating space for some progress. We have a stack of legal principles and civil norms that are a toolbox which we can use to apply to the approach. And if we merge humanitarian and environmental considerations, we have more opportunities for engagement. And obviously, civil society has an important role to play in this. Um, we've got a load more stuff on the website, which is toxicremnantsofwar.info. There's a couple of things back there. If you want to read up more, we've got a blog where we talk about all sorts of stuff. Uh, and then finally, yeah, that'll be about it. Thanks. All right, thanks, Doug. Um, before we go to Lenny, it, I, just one question from me. It, it's like, what do you? How does this relate, for example, to the to the CWC? Are you are you envisioning in the future a similar treaty, but then on on toxic uh, substances, or or are you seeking to uh, to broaden the scope of the CWC, or or is it a different uh, ball game altogether? Um, I think it's a different ball game altogether. We. Um, we looked at the CWC initially, and particularly on the list of prescribed substances, and we spent quite a lot of time looking at military use substances, we concluded that for a lot of them, there isn't a lot of environmental or health data available on them. Um, and it seemed that, well, it's always going to be difficult to restrict particular substances, and perhaps always seems better or more practical to be able to focus on reducing harm in conflicts and uh, cleaning up the problem. So, uh, yeah, I mean, that's going to be the focus. More like a CCW, Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons, Protocol 5, which dealt with clearance of explosive remnants of war. Perhaps there could be something similar on environmental cleanup. Um, but I think even without a big piece of legislation, being able to improve a number of people who are gathering environmental data and public health data would be the single most important thing which we could uh, achieve, I think. Thanks. Unless there's a question purely for clarification, I think we'll, we'll go to uh, Lenny Siegel. Basically, everybody knows the war kills people, maims, causes all kinds of destruction, and damages the natural environment. Uh, Doug's talked about that. What people don't, next slide, please. But not everybody realizes that long after the wars are over, um, there are risks that are created both for the ecosystems and the people. And what we've learned uh, for American fighters, whether they be the, the people who were involved in nuclear testing in the Pacific, uh, fighting in Vietnam, or deployed near burn pits in the Middle East, um, that people are exposed to uh, hazards that they didn't count on. And they know they're going to be shot at, uh, but long after they come back, they, uh, many of them exhibit uh, diseases uh, that appear to be a result of exposures while they were in war zones. Next slide. Basically, not only war, but the preparation for war is bad for the environment. It puts fighters, and there's a letter missing there, fighters and their families at unexpected risk. So the best example of that is Camp Lejeune, a marine base in North Carolina where the people who, who live there as Marines and family members of Marines were drinking toxic water contaminated with chlorinated solvents, trichloroethylene, tetrachloroethylene, for years. And that's been, become a big issue in the U.S. Uh, because hundreds of thousands of Marines and their families, and the, the fellow, former Marine Master Sergeant, who brought, go back please, uh, brought that forward, did it because his daughter died at age seven of leukemia, um, and he believes it was a result of that exposure. Uh, so again, the Marines expect to go overseas and fight and get shot at. They don't want the Marines to put their families at risk back home. And from my experience, I live near a military base. Uh, the contamination from that base um, threatens our environment, our health, and makes it difficult, because it's closed now, uh, the, re the reuse is threatened by the presence of the contamination that the military has left behind. And basically, any major 
military base in the United States is seriously contaminated with a variety of substances and in many cases munitions. Next. So this is from a report I wrote in 1991 uh, called the U.S. Military's Toxic Legacy. And basically, you know, we're always worried that terrorists are going to come and attack us with chemical weapons, but what happens if the, the agency doing the contamination poisoning us is our own military? And this is a, an issue that not only Americans face, but people in many countries. I know just from a quick search of the internet of a couple of places in Israel, Ramat HaSharon, where there's perchlorate in the drinking water, and here in Tel Aviv, uh, near Givatayim, if I got that right, is Israel Military Industries uh, closed a facility uh, that left behind toxic solvents that made it difficult to redevelop the property and caused the same problem that we're facing in Mountain View, where I live, which is vapor intrusion. If you have trichloroethylene or similar substances in shallow groundwater, it's actually sucked up into buildings, and the people who occupy those buildings are exposed anytime they breathe to the contamination that the military left behind. Next slide. So I'm going to summarize some of the ways that the U.S. government is spending money on cleaning up this mess. And the United States in, is probably the most transparent country in the world in disclosing this information. In fact, I would argue that sometimes they disclose too much information so it's hard to figure out, uh, to, to wade through it to find out what's really going on. Basically, the United States has a life, currently calculated life cycle program for dealing with hazardous waste, that's toxic and radioactive waste in military bases, current and former, of over $50 billion. Um, more recently, they've, they've agreed to, to clean up munitions uh, facilities like military ranges, and the cost right now is $13 billion. It used to be higher, but we've been working on new technologies to make it more efficient. Um, I, th I think people understand the, the toxic emissions, you know, the groundwater's contaminated, uh, radioactive wastes are left behind, uh, the soil's got heavy metals in it. With munitions, the issue is primarily unexploded ordnance. What that means was when a weapon is fired or dropped, approximately 5%, depending upon the weapon, could be 10%, of the munitions do not explode as designed. And that becomes unexploded ordnance. And so somebody who picks it up later, uh, throws it around, throws it in a campfire, may get blown up. And it means that large swaths of land uh, that are training ranges are not available for reuse because of all the unexploded ordnance left behind. Uh, less of an issue, but related to what we've been talking about, is the chemicals from which explosives are made are toxic. RDX, TNT, those chemicals are toxic when these munitions experience what's called a low order detonation. That is, they blow up but not all the way. They leave toxic substances on the battlefield. So at the Massachusetts Military Reservation on Cape Cod, they're concerned about RDX uh, in the groundwater as a result of primarily of the incomplete detonation of weapons. And there's another category, discarded military munitions. It's not, sometimes they just bury munitions. You, you're coming back from a day in training and you've got all these munitions. You're supposed to wait in line to turn them back in as you might just dig a hole in the ground and drop them uh, in that hole. And they function essentially like unexploded ordnance, but technically they're discarded military munitions. And that can be done on a larger scale, many places where they use a bulldozer and just bury things rather than deal with them in the long run. Next slide, please. Um, the largest environmental program in the world that I'm familiar with is the, uh, the U.S. Department of Energy's program for dealing with radioactive wastes. And this is, like you can see, is on the order of hundreds of billions of dollars. Um, and the numbers there don't include everything anyhow. And these don't just include cleanup of soil and groundwater, but the management of waste, like in tanks at Hanford, Washington, they're managed. The problem with radioactive waste is you can't make it go away. You can concentrate it, which makes it more hazardous in one way, or you can distribute it, and it makes it more hazardous in another, another way. But for most of the, the radioactive substances associated with the production of nuclear weapons, you can't make it go away. 
exception might be tritium, which has a half-life of about 11 years. So this is the biggest problem with nuclear weapons, or the biggest cleanup problem in terms of budget, and it is a big problem uh, in many, in, at many large facilities in the United St States, and those large facilities like Hanford are so big that they don't even talk about the smaller ones left over from the Manhattan Project and immediately after World War II. Um, those are being addressed by the Army Corps of Engineers, but on this, you know, th that program's a few billion dollars. People hardly ever talk about it because it's not a few hundred billion dollars. Next. Most people aren't aware that conventional munition disposal is an environmental cost. Uh, this, this gives some figures on it. I, I actually think it's a lot higher. But the main thing is that most munitions are not used in war or training. They're left in the stockpile and they deteriorate and they have to be disposed of. And so doing that safely is actually very difficult. It's very easy. Well, it's not that easy to blow them up, but you can blow them up, but then you tend to expose people and the environment to these toxic chemicals uh, that they're made of. Uh, so what they usually tend to do is sit on it for a long period of time, and they do have facilities. They're developing better technologies, but this is, again, one of the other costs of preparation for war is munitions that are never used. And we're, also, you know, we're very happy that they aren't used, but once you've made them, uh, you've got to do something with them. Next. And this is what we're talking about primarily today. Uh, in, in the United States had, as John Pascal said, you know, 30,000 uh, Asian tons of chemical weapons uh, at eight domestic locations and the Johnston Island in the Pacific, which was European weapons. And um, the, the main program for, for destroying that was about $28 billion. Now that doesn't just include the agent, it includes the, the rest of the weapons, it includes the plants for making the weapons, and it actually includes getting rid of the plants that were used to destroy the weapons. Uh, Paul's gonna be talking a lot more about that. The main program was primarily incineration, but not exclusively. What's remaining now is the alternatives program that many of us supported because we believe neutralization was uh, a good alternative to incineration, less likely to release contaminants into the environment, but that too has escalated in cost to $11 billion. The two sites in that program at this point are in Kentucky and Colorado. And what people don't talk about much, but there was a recent National Academy of St Sciences study, is about recovered chemical warfare material. And these are primarily buried chemical munitions and the United States has actually had a very good program, they call it the non-stockpile program, um, for dealing with that. The, the technical term we used to use when they would find that at, say, Fort Gillum or in, 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 in Georgia or Schofield Barracks in Hawaii, the, the technical term is onesies and twosies. <laughs> they'd find a couple chem chemical weapons and they would dispose of them. Then you have a few places like Pine Bluff, Arkansas, and Spring Valley, which is a, a, a very wealthy residential area in Washington, D.C., where old chemical munitions were found. And those have been dug up and destroyed. They continue to find uh, more of them in Spring Valley. And that program has proceeded very well. But now that, the, that we're starting to, well, we, we're to achieve our obligations, under the Chemical Weapons Convention, we're realizing that there's another big problem out there, and these are major burial sites in places like the Redstone Arsenal in Alabama, where there are 90,000 buried intact chemical munitions and hundreds of thousands of other items of chemical warfare material. Now, those items were buried in trenches as disposal because back in the day, we didn't have better ways to get rid of them. So this was, this was disposal, you know, this was where we were done with them. Well, it turns out that, that, the, that, the, that the Army and NASA have, are building new facilities, and they, you know, they are encountering these trenches as they dig foundations for new buildings. So the state of Alabama is requiring that the U.S. do something about them, the, the federal government do something about it. Well, the way it works with buried munitions is they only come into the, the coverage, correct me if I'm wrong, of the Chemical Weapons Convention when they are unearthed. And once they are unearthed, there is a responsibility to dispose of them. 
well, we don't have the capacity to dispose of 90,000 munitions uh, in, in an uncertain state. You know, these have been buried, they're deteriorated, maybe some of them were burned. And so the U.S. Army is looking at to what degree should we dig these up and how should we deal with them? Can we develop greater capacity systems that would uh, address the risk from unearthing this stuff, which is not posing an immediate risk to people, but it's still there and it's still very, it's still lethal. And so it, depending upon what they decide to do, uh, the cost is listed as anywhere from 2.5 to $17 billion. Now, beyond that, and Paul reminded me of this, but because there are no numbers, it's not on the slide, we also have, you go back, you go back please, um, sea dumped chemical munitions. After World War II, there was a program called Operation Chase, C-H-A-S-E. That stands for cut, cut Holes and Sink Them. And what they did is they loaded chemical munitions onto ships and they sunk them off the coast of the Atlantic coast of the U.S., the West Coast, and, the, and near Alaska. And, and uh, in Europe and in Japan, they have similar situations where there are sea dumped chemical munitions. We don't know how hazardous those are, whether they've all dispersed into the environment or they're essentially time bombs that are going to destroy the ocean ecosystems when they release all the chemicals. We do know that there are some smaller sites um, off the coast of New Jersey. There is a, a clam shelling industry where they excavate clam shells from deep in the ocean and they bring them to land, they grind them up, and they use them as surfaces for parking lots and driveways. And unfortunately, uh, somewhere along there, some ship dumped some chemical munitions, and as well as conventional. Some of them appear to have been World War I munitions that were brought, dis initially stored on land in the U.S. and then dumped. But I don't know, maybe five or ten years ago, they found wh one of those chemical munitions in a driveway in Dover, Delaware, uh, because the clam shellers brought it up and the, an intact mustard round was in that driveway and some, some Air Force explosive ordnance disposal uh, specialists were exposed to mustard agent as a result of that. So just because it's out of sight and deep in the ocean doesn't mean that there's no risk of exposure. Well, we have, we have, there, we have no program for even assessing that risk, let alone addressing it. It may turn out that the thing we need to do after studying it is leave it there but there's, right now there's no program for dealing with it. Next slide. So these are, t yeah, I'm squeezing less than that. So two key principles that come out of my experience with this is that these are costs that are incurred when the decisions are made to prepare for or go to war. When you build a weapon, you have to figure out wh what is it gonna cost to do away with it? Uh, what is it gonna cost to if you're cleaning planes, what is it going to cost to clean up the environment when you're all done cleaning those, those planes? It's not something that somehow uh, people like me are causing the military to have to deal with after the fact. This has to be part of the accounting system when they get started. And uh, as we know from chemical weapons, I think Paul said maybe three orders of magnitude, um, it's pretty cheap to make chemical weapons or landmines. It's very hard to find the landmines, and it's very expensive to safely get rid of the chemical munitions. Next slide. So here are three recommendations I, I recently made at a conference. First is the United States should be cooperating with, with countries in war zones to clean up the remnants of war, like Agent Orange in Vietnam is a good example. Should take re presumptive responsibility for the health impacts that uh, exposures have on the war fighters and their families. This is the Camp Lejeune example where we got legislation passed which said that people shouldn't have to prove they're sick because they were exposed. If they were exposed and the Marines caused it, then they should be given health services. Uh, it's similar to Agent Orange for U.S. veterans. And this is what I work on is the U.S. government should be cleaning up the land and the water that's been polluted by, by warfare and preparations for war. Um, that is, a, you know, the U.S. has perhaps the largest military in human history, and it's a, been a heavy industrial military, so it has damaged millions of acres with munitions and 
thousands of sites with toxic substances, and we have an obligation to clean it up. Um, again, we have a fairly transparent system where we're actually making a lot of progress. It's a constant struggle. The military always tries to say, do a little bit less than we want them to, uh, but we're, we're making a lot of progress in that direction uh, because we need to use that land and that water. And those of you who live in a much smaller country uh, must recognize that any land that's been put off, off limits by the military greatly constrains your ability, ability to thrive. Uh, land that has unexploded ordnance on it shouldn't be used for housing. Uh, you shouldn't be putting, <coughs> shouldn't be watering orange groves with perchlorate, and you shouldn't be uh, have, forcing people to live, work, and go to school in, in, in buildings that are contaminated with the effluent from military industries. Next slide. So that's basically it. Uh, Wilfred mentioned my, my forum. Um, it's, it's free. It's uh, basic, mostly um, excerpts and links to news articles on military contamination issues with, a, with an emphasis on the United States. Uh, sometimes we will link to reports. Uh, but it is um, it's a rather regular and easy to use source on the military. We also do that on, do that on, on civilian sites. Um, I'm actually doing more work these days on civilian sites because that's where my funding comes from. Uh, but once you start doing this work, you don't want to abandon the communities um, that are, again, fighting uh, the, the toxic remnants of preparation for war. Thank you. Uh, thank you both. A question from me before we uh, uh, open the floor for the, for the whole group. Because you, I, I think you quite rightly say that um, the U.S. is uh, extremely transparent in comparison to most countries. Are you aware of similar programs or similar figures from the region here? Are, are, is there anything comparable out in the open, or is it all uh, secretive and, and closed? I, ass I assume it's it's secretive. Now I don't I don't speak Arabic or 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 Hebrew, so conceivably there are sources. I doubt it. Uh, you know, even in England, um, it's hard to get information uh, of this sort. Very brief question. Uh, the army, army and military in general really takes uh, into account uh, the impact on its own fighters and everything. And I had that, my own experience with that in the Yom Kippur War when due to firing right next to my ear, I lost a certain amount of hearing. And only after that, they say, okay, we will now include in your uh, equipment earplugs. In other words, they hadn't thought of that before. Now, I think of Bob Dylan's Masters of War, and you talked about the whole question of um, considering those who manufacture war material, taking into account the costs of uh, cleaning it up afterwards. Have you had any success? It's hard for me to imagine, but is there any possible indications of success in taking that into account as part of the planning? We've had some success in getting the U.S. military to engage in what's called pollution prevention. So there, say about a year or two ago, there was a memo for eliminating hexavalent chromium from weapon systems. It's a very toxic substance, and it turns out it doesn't need to be used. It just they've been using it and they had requirements for using it. So they're phasing that out. Um, they aren't using trichloroethylene anymore uh, in military industries or in the military as a solvent. So yes, we, we've had progress, but the legacy of that use in the past um, lasts a very long time. Uh, and um, some of the issues that you run into, um, I, I mentioned the Massachusetts Military Reservation, an area in Cape Cod, highly populated area with contaminated groundwater, and because of the the lead in munitions, the Army started using tungsten as an alternative, uh, and that lasted a while until they realized that the tungsten was also toxic, and there are are better alternatives for training rounds for small ammunition using plastic, uh, but it's very hard in many instances to find something that meets military requirements and is actually better because just because something's different doesn't mean that it's better. 
give an example? Yeah, maybe have um, two examples. Um, the tungsten one was interesting. So we worked on depleted uranium for a long time. The US is now putting a lot of funding into finding alternative uses for or alternative materials for armor piercing ammunition. One of the alternatives was an alloy of tungsten and nickel and cobalt, and they were doing an experiment on rats. Uh, and the tungsten was in there as a control in the experiment, and then all the rats with the tungsten sort of died three months later of a really aggressive cancer, at which point they were like, oh, OK, hold on. <laughs> um, and so there's kind of been situations like that where there has been learning and response from a US military. And I was chatting with a guy uh, a couple of months ago about a new toxicity screening process that they're developing which is kind of a seven stage process which goes from the computer design of new molecules for explosives for example right through different layers of testing before it's finally tested the environment to try and weed out things which are problematic so in terms of new weapons and new materials there does seem to be a changing mindset but the vast majority of weapons still in use are old toxic hazardous materials so it's going to be a very slow process For me, it's a moral dilemma, you know. How much effort do you put in figuring out ways to kill people in a more environmentally sensitive way? Thank you both for, I think, a very, both very interesting and very complimentary uh, presentations. Um, I want to ask a question on technology. I mean, one of the, one of the uh, challenges we have, I think, in general remediation efforts, but also uh, weapons destruction efforts, in other words, eliminate, safe elimination of weapon systems, uh, is is the technologies, and I think a spin-off that <clears throat> you're both aware of of the uh, chemical weapons destruction program was the increasing pressure uh, over the last you know 20 years or more that communities and and um, and uh, activists and researchers like ourselves have all put on on uh, the military and the governments to in fact design better ways to destroy chemical weapons. But the spin-off from that has been that we've also learned how to destroy conventional weapons much better as well. So we've produced, you know, bioremediation programs. We've pr we've uh, uh, produced uh, neutralization programs. We produced the the field deployable hydrolysis systems that we used on the Cape Ray for the Syrian chemical weapons destruction program. Um, and we've produced, uh, you know, closed burn and detonation systems. <coughs> and I'm wondering, in both your your uh, your cases, battlefield toxic waste and, and weapon systems and military toxic waste, um, Lenny. You know, to what extent do you think that open burn, open detonation, what we what we in the field call OBOD, which has been the traditional method of of uh, destruction of anything you want to get rid of in the mil in the military, uh, you you know put everything out in the field, you blow it up, and there are a variety. You can bury it partially and blow it up, or you can try to take the explosive powder out of it and burn the explosive powder, but it's basically open burn, open detonation in which all effluent is released into the environment one way or another, in the groundwater, the soil, or the atmosphere, uh, or are we moving forward with more sophisticated uh, closed burn, closed detonation, closed treatment systems like we see being used now in uh, China for abandoned chemical weapons. Uh, we've seen it by the Japanese and the Chinese. We've seen it used in the United States in Spring Valley that I'll talk about a little bit later too, Lenny, about you know destroying chemical weapons in people's backyards, basically in in wealthy residential communities in the United States. And for unexploded ordnance here in Europe, it's probably very much the case in Israel. I think too, Israel is such a small country where we we talk about three or four thousand military bases. You saw that Lenny put up on the slide. Only in the United States, you know, you can imagine how many that is per state. You, you could never have three or 4,000 military bases here in Israel. It's too small a country. But all of this polluted land is put out of any sort of productive civilian usage unless it's either protected to begin with or is remediated and cleaned up. And that's the big economic cost. So my question is really on technology development for you both. I remember in, uh, it was 1990, the Pentagon had a conference, and I was sitting at a table with a guy from the Army Missile Command who had developed a pro uh, um, some, something called uh, supercritical super ammonia uh, destruction of rocket fuel, and basically took, a, took apart ammonium perchlorate rockets back into their constituents. 
And uh, it turned out there were a lot of people in U.S. military laboratories working on similar kinds of things because they were scientists, and this was interesting stuff to do. And just, just as they could develop a new weapon, they could develop a, a demilitarization system. So we've actually had a lot, of, a lot of this stuff developed. The question is, is the requirement there? And so the reason that we ended up with the field deployable hydrolysis system, a neutralization system for chemical weapons, is because communities were dissatisfied with open burning or even with incineration contained explosion because of you start to destroy chemical weapons in a community, people are gonna worry that somehow you're gonna release them. And with the neutralization system, even though you generate more neutralant waste that still needs to be treated because it's toxic, um, the Army developed this coincidentally just in time for the Syrian demilitarization program. So this to me was a victory for the, the local environmental groups around the United States who've been questioning the use of open burning and of incineration. But the key to it, besides public knowledge and public involvement, is environmental regulation. And the militaries of our respective countries need to be subject to the environmental laws of our country. And we've had repeated battles in the United States over to what degree can the military be exempted from environmental laws. And the, the irony of it is many of the, the conservative areas in the, of the United States which are not strong on environmental regulation are actually strong on environmental regulation over the U.S. federal government because they are from states that, that have a strong states' right background and they don't like the federal government. So they're more willing to regulate the military and the Department of Energy than they are private industry. But without that regulatory oversight, the requirement that you do something cleaner, then the military will continue to do the thing which is cheapest in the short run. So, so I don't know, uh, I suspect that the environmental regulators in Israel have very little influence over any active installation of the military or active uh, industrial production plant uh, that's supplying the military. But that's a, an essential step in making sure that the newer technologies that have been developed in the United States and Germany and Japan for more safely dealing with chemical weapons are used. Because, it, again, it's, well, we saw what happened in Iraq. The U.S. went in and they blew things up. And now we're hearing that the, that the troops that were there cleaning up the mess were exposed. So it's not a safe way to do it, but it, you know, if you're, you don't have much of a budget and no one's looking over your shoulder, that's what you're gonna do. And in the UK, the, um, the Queen owns all the land that uh, the Ministry of Defense practice on, and the uh, Queen is currently exempt, and the Ministry of Defense are currently exempt from UK environmental law. So they uh, issue their own guidelines and assess their own environmental impact. Uh, in fact, that's just coming to an end in Scotland, actually. The new Scottish government has changed that when it comes to nuclear installations in Scotland. Um, just in terms of the environmentally friendly methods of disposal, we have been talking a lot with the mine action community who are out clearing landmines and blowing up stockpiles uh, and cleaning up accidents from uh, accidental blasts at uh, stockpiles. And at the moment, the fair, it varies. Those who are more interested in commercial side of demining, it's basically whatever they can do at the lowest cost. From those who are on the civil society, uh, humanitarian side of mine action, there's a lot more interest in trying to integrate some environmental considerations into their operations. It's quite a difficult conversation to have because you're talking to people who deal with things that explode for a living. So when you start talking about cancer risks or other health risks <laughs> from chronic exposure 10 years or 20 years down the line, it's quite difficult for them to get their heads around. Um, but it's changing slowly and the toxic remnants stuff seems to be resonating with some. So we're talking to uh, one group now who they're doing clearance of explosive remnants of war around an Albanian uh, arms depot which exploded. Uh, there's arable land, local community are using the land uh, it's, it was about 10 or 15 years ago, but it, it went up, and they're quite interested in trying to integrate some environmental analysis into that to look at levels of heavy metals and uh, explosives in the soil and whether they're a risk to local people. 
one of the key challenges is the cost of analysis, um, which is currently quite prohibitive if you're trying to do uh, a number of samples. Um, so yeah, so that's a conversation we're starting to have uh, and hopefully some work will improve because this environmental data should be taken as standard in the clearance of this work. But a lot of the time they're just going to look at what's the quickest and short-term safest way of disposing of these munitions, many of which may be unstable, to blow them up in situ or to blow them up in the woods somewhere uh, near sites. I, I assume from your presentation, Lenny, that in the States, the work that you do is able to catch some attention from the military, or you said something about transparency being high. But here, um, civil society organizations and environmental organizations um, have no clout whatsoever with the military. Nobody touches the military. Nobody goes there. And it seems like if uh, any of these moves would happen here, they would have to be led by former military people or um, not from NGOs and civil society organizations. So I'm wondering if you have, first, if anybody here from the Israeli audience knows of such initiatives that are happening by military people. And if not, if you have some thoughts about models to get those people to the table amongst themselves, if they're not going to pay attention to any of the people sitting in this room. Well, first, you're right. NGOs don't touch that. NGOs don't touch the military. Definitely not uh, chemical weapons or... But I don't think that we should uh, accept it. And uh, I think that uh, we already said that we're going to meet next week. This is exactly what we're supposed to do. Uh, in um, 2000 and something, uh, for example, <laughs> I don't remember the year, uh, we decided that we had enough with the, with the compound in uh, Ramat Sharon, not allowing the, the inspectors of the Ministry of uh, Health and uh, the protection of the environment getting in. We just took a few cars and locked all the workers inside the compound. And uh, we all got arrested, but uh, the cars stayed there, and the workers couldn't leave. And uh, the, na the, the next day, they did allow them to get in. So we can have some impact if we are creative. And uh, I think that we should think about how to be creative like that. Mm, hopefully, Lenny, this isn't what you're going to say, but um, if so, you can you can uh, complement what I say. A, a few years, uh, over a decade ago, Lenny and I were both involved in something called the National Dialogue on Military Munitions. Um, and this was put together by the uh, U.S. military forces, Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marine Corps. And uh, they were very concerned because of the growing uh, criticism of highly polluted uh, military bases, and particularly training ranges, firing ranges, practice ranges for U.S. military forces. And the firing ranges uh, had not been cleaned, most of them, for a long period of time. And after, <coughs> you know, environmental regulations came in uh, and public health regulations came in, Clean Air Act and Clean Water Act and things of that nature, the military realized that unless they could prove uh, what the toxic condition was of these firing ranges, uh, they probably couldn't use them much longer. And so the big question became, it was really a, what we thought was a win-win uh, for the military forces to continue to train in the same places they've been training on for decades and decades. They had to go in and evaluate the environmental impact and to see how they could remediate. And some of the services, I think it was the Marine Corps, if I recall correctly, had really practiced um, fire and clean up, fire and clean up, fire and clean up. You know, they went in. So there wasn't too much unexploded ordnance, and you could go in and actually assess what the groundwater and the the soil and the like was. Most of the services did not. They bombed, they fired, you know, it's just a practice, next month we do it again, next month we do it again. And uh, they all felt kind of the end resort, if we ever close these ranges, would be to create a conservation area, a wildlife area, because nobody could walk in these, even go into these areas. They were so dangerous to, to even step in. Um, so that produced actually a very good report, and I think that, that uh, study um, has really uh, begun to promote um, ongoing cleanup and uh, better environmental practices within the military services. It also came, it also came shortly after the, the big four or five rounds of base closure that we had in the United States at the end of the Cold War. Uh, 
<clears throat> and they were, because I was very involved when I was in the House of Representatives uh, and the Armed Services Committee at that point, uh, big fights developed between states and local communities and the military as they tried to close these bases and move them off the, the uh, federal budget and get them locally redeveloped again. And to locally redevelop them, they had to be clean, uh, relatively clean, depending on what you wanted to do with them. And there were fights over for the simplest stuff, for example, um, in the Bay Area, San Francisco and, and uh, uh, the Bay Area in California, uh, one, of the, one of the bases, which was relatively clean, but had loads of lead, <coughs> you know, heavy metal lead in it. And a lot of the lead was actually in the bay, in the water. And we said, why would, why would there be lead, all this lead in the bay? It turns out that the officers club there had a skeet shooting range, and they fired lead skeets out over the bay and, you know, shot at them. Uh, and they did that for decades and decades and decades, and they filled the bay with horrible toxic lead. And so you had, you know, not from military practice, but actually from the officers club itself, you had lead in the bay, and they had to clean that up. And another big issue was lead paint. They wanted to privatize and sell off loads of these beautiful homes for officers and uh, on various military bases. And the states came in and fought against that until they actually cleaned up the lead paint. And as you know, military, military to keep the troops busy, like to scrape and paint, scrape and paint, scrape and paint. And so all these homes were filled with lead paint, and all the soil around the homes had like some of them a thousand times the permissible level of lead in the soil. And so you could not sell these homes to uh, families, particularly families with children who would play in the yard. And so the states came in themselves and are continuing, I think, to force military to in fact clean up, you know, strip the lead paint in the house, in the houses, clean up all the soil, it means you have to remove the soil basically from around and replace it around all the homes, or in fact, tear the whole house down. Nobody wanted to do that with beautiful, expensive homes like this. So Lenny and I could probably go on and on and tell loads of stories about this, but you can make, I think, a dialogue with the military into a win-win situation in which it helps the military, in fact, prevents pollution of their own troops and their families, as Lenny has talked about, uh, uh, but also, in fact, serves good purpose because the, if the land is ever given up for commercial use, it in fact is is redevelopable. Otherwise, you can you can never use these lands again. Two two quick answers. One is, you happen to be in a place where a whole lot of people have actually served in the military, and people like you are in a better position to say, hey, you put us at risk not just of enemy bullets, but of lo chronic health risk because of our exposures to chemicals that the military has released. Also, people who work in the industries. So, so at Camp Lejeune, uh, the, the people I work with got a whole lot of support from people across the political s spectrum because they were Marines. Uh, and, and a lot of other communities, people don't get that kind of support. The other thing, Paul referred to the, this dialogue on military munitions. I introduced the word sustainability to the military. And sustainability, you know, I think, you know, we ha environmentalists have clear ideas what that means, but the, we, we made a list of four things, and I said the fourth thing is the ability to continue to use your ranges. Um, and they like that. They moved it to number one. <laughs> but it helped introduce the concept that you don't just destroy the landscape and move on to another area to destroy with munitions training but you have to manage it in a way that you can continue to use it so you don't have to fight to get that new land from other people who might want it for development or national parks or whatever. So again, we, we adopted a, an expanded notion of sustainability and the military actually bought into it and continued to buy into it uh, when George W. Bush was elected president. He started uh, a campaign to undermine a series of environmental laws, but working with career people in the military, we actually developed a whole range of cooperative activity between the military and environmental groups. Um, and, and we basically, and this, this was hard for me because I'm a longtime anti-war activist in, in the States, but to cooperate with the military against a common foe, which was urban sprawl. Uh, 
Yeah, just very briefly, I think you can get quite far with enlightened self-interest. Um, we've long been in touch with uh, military personnel and veterans who are concerned about their own personal exposure to toxic materials from munitions and, and others. And from an advocacy perspective, we found it to be really effective in reaching those parts where the left-leaning anti-war movement isn't particularly effective at reaching. Um, so, yeah, and I think <clears throat> some of the approaches and technologies that have been developed out of concern for expo troop exposure, so more work now being done when the US or others uh, set up a base overseas in Afghanistan, there will be more environmental assessment and monitoring, and some of the methodologies that are being used, we're looking to try and transfer to a civilian uh, protection setting. So. There's interest from within the military themselves, certainly from within personnel, um, and also approaches and methodologies that the military use, which could then be transferred to other settings. A couple of uh, quick points uh, to Doug first. Yes, the Queen may be exempted in the UK from uh, many laws, but uh, very explicitly she's not ex exempted from the Chemical Weapons Convention. And yeah, you, you uh, can laugh about it, but Actually, it means that for certain types of issues, you can actually draw on the Chemical Weapons Convention to uh, undertake certain types of action, including the way uh, chemical weapons and other remnants of uh, chemical warfare need to be eliminated, and environmental laws must uh, apply, national ones. Um, to uh, go to Lenny, uh, when you were mentioning uh, the stuff that's still somewhere underground or on the bottom of the seas. Um, the Chemical Weapons Convention is interesting here because basically it says let it lie, uh, particularly if they were sea dumped or buried before treaty specified uh, days. If you're going to lift them, if you're going to dig them up, lift them from uh, the seabed, you come into an interesting legal vacuum uh, in the sense that what happens with those munitions, must you declare them to the OPCW as a consequence of which all the requirements of the CWC in terms of their destruction, including deadlines and whatever, all start uh, kicking in, which is going to be uh, a major legal and uh, commercial uh, enterprise uh, within the country. On top of which, that you can have some of those bright congressmen uh, that seem to rule the Senate and uh, the House uh, nowadays, arguing, yeah, but this was not really our stuff. It came from the Germans, so the Germans have to pay for it, and uh, blah, blah, blah. And there is the whole uh, issue of Taboon ending up somewhere on the Pacific Islands, which nobody, on well, we do understand why they got there, but, uh, you know, uh, from the OPC. So uh, uh, a whole variety of uh, elements would uh, kick in here with uh, deadlines. And the reason why I bring it up is uh, to link to our Israeli friends here. Uh, we, we don't know a lot about Israel's chemical warfare program in the past, but we do know that after the creation of the State of Israel, there was one. And uh, that went on for a number of years, probably into the 50s, and may have ended more or less coinci coincidentally with uh, the nuclear weapon uh, program. The only source that I'm aware of uh, that has some basic facts on that program is in uh, the book by Avner Cohen on uh, the US nuclear bomb. And uh, one, one of the concrete actions that uh, people like yourself, civil society in Israel could do is actually try to uh, get more information on uh, what happened because if indeed uh, Israel actually produced a stockpile, and I don't know whether they did, whether it moved beyond research and development, but if they produced a stockpile and it's somewhere buried, it is something that might come up in terms of the discussions uh, we have had here uh, today. I mean, sprawling centers, um, uh, you know, land being developed for different purposes than uh, what happened uh, before. It could be quite an issue. and. Obviously, if Israel uh, was to join the Chemical Weapons Convention to ratify the treaty, it would have to submit a declaration on any type of chemical weapon activity it undertook since the 1st of January 1946. So that would be part of it. 
then the question becomes, okay, if there are buried skeletons, uh, so to speak, then of course they can leave them buried. They would be entirely uh, entitled to do so uh, under the terms of the Chemical Weapons Convention. But then the problem uh, becomes one in terms of redevelopment and things do come up at a certain point, like in, uh, is it uh, Spring Valley uh, in uh, the DC area? I mean, we have it in Belgium all the time with the World War I munitions. So um, that's uh, just uh, one thing where perhaps you can start thinking, how can we get access to that type of information? How can you uh, publicize it that as something more concrete, more tangible to uh, civil society here uh, to try to think of in terms of promoting the CWC? One of the reasons to do this sort of thing in a timely way is the people who know where the skeletons are buried and where the chemical weapons are buried are dying off. I served on a series of National Academy of Sciences committees looking at chemical weapons demilitarization. And there was one old guy, he was like about 80, 85, 90, I don't know. And he just knew a whole lot about chemical weapons. and thinking about, you know, there are a lot of younger guys on the committee and women, and, and thinking about his age, he worked for DuPont, um, he was one of the people who made them, obviously. And he was perfectly happy, you know, he was doing his job to help get rid of them. He was, it, wasn't, it wasn't a moral issue for him, was, it, his, his job is to understand the, the chemistry and to deal with it. He was extremely valuable, he knew this stuff backward and forward. And the sooner we do this, you know, the, this, the more we can take advantage of the expertise of the people who were part of these programs when they were active.